Hi, everybody. Welcome, Philoli members. I'm Erica Frank. I'm Philoli's Director of Education and Interpretation. I'm so happy to be your host today for our first Garden Happy Hour. You are muted, which means you can't speak and we can't see you, but we would love to take your questions. So I encourage you to use the Q&A feature that's down at the bottom of your screen. It is my pleasure to introduce Jim Salyard, who's Philoli's Director of Horticulture. Jim and I are enjoying our themed cocktail, which is a vanilla Paloma. It was inspired by Philoli's vanilla orchid. I know, Jim, you still have to put the finishing touches on yours, so go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Erica. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm uh, out in the greenhouse courtyard uh, where we'll be touring around. Um, but first, let me start with my cocktail. So here I have um, everything pre-mixed. Um, I actually realized I had no tequila, so I made it with gin, which is my um, alcohol of choice. And I have my glass. And let me just set up my tripod real quick. And I have right here, um, vanilla um, that I've made from one of those little make your own kits but uh, you know you can buy vanilla beans and just stick them into a bottle with and fill it up with alcohol and if you have a couple bottles with you know five or ten vanilla beans if you can get them at a good deal um, you can use one bottle and then um, when it's empty refill it and then grab your other bottle but here's a vanilla bean that I've had for years and years, and uh, this is my vanilla. So let me quickly just add this. Hopefully you can see that. I added a dash of vanilla, mix it up, pour it into my glass. Okay. So let's get started. Um, so this is the greenhouse courtyard. Um, the, uh, the beginnings of the greenhouse area began in 1921 when Arthur Brown started drawing up the plans for the this complex. Um, there are three greenhouses. Uh, there's the main greenhouse, kind of the queen of the, uh, the group here. This is the south house, our production house. And then um, opposite, the north greenhouse, uh, is the third greenhouse. I'll call, we'll go inside and I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. Um, the third, uh, Third bigger building here on the, the structure in the courtyard is the head house. This is uh, the horticulture staff headquarters and it's used for a lot of events and parties and things like that. And then the little building, kitty corner to that is the um, boiler room building and there's also restrooms and some storage in there. So um, let's first head into the main greenhouse and take a sip of my cocktail. Delicious. And <clears throat> We'll go inside. So this is um, our tropical house. It's broken up into three rooms. You can see our orchid room to the south. This is what we call the main room and then the room to the north. Philoli's greenhouse, this main greenhouse is purported to be one of the oldest in the country that's continuously been used to grow tropical plants. Um, it's, it's continuously been used for the original purpose for which it was built, which is to grow tropical plants um, to be used on display in the house. And we now also display those in the garden house and the um, other buildings on the property. But just to kind of walk you through and talk to you about some of the plants and some of their, the significance of them. Um, this room here has a lot of begonias. Begonias were uh, a big addition during the Roth era. Some of our plants date back to the Roth era. Um, is, a lot of this is um, the understanding uh, oral tradition that we know uh, about some of the plants. Um, so it's not documented anywhere, but there is a legacy from Mrs. Roth to today that um, where these stories have been uh, <clears throat> uh, verbally told. So that's how we know the story on the plants. Moving into the, the room to the uh, north, um, very important plant that um, is definitely attributed to the Roths is the um, flamingo flower, the an Anthurium andrianum with the big red flowers. Um, we know the Roths um, kept these in Hawaii and brought them back and have been kept at Philoli ever since. Um, these are plants that have been propagated from the original plants, but they're the same exact genetic material as the Roths. An important born air plant 
Um, one of two that we still have is the Anthurium crystal, uh, Clarinervium. Uh, it's a leathery leaved, um, beautiful leaved um, Anthurium. And this is one of the hot house plants today um, where you can spend over $100 for a small little plant for something like this. And we have a beautiful collection of them and um, they're just a great foundational plant um, that are used in the house. Um, we have lots of gingers that aren't um, quite in bloom yet. Um, some other philodendrons, uh, some philodendrons that are in the collection. Uh, we'll talk about more of those in one of the other greenhouses. Um, we have a big monstera uh, here, the variegated split leaf monstera. Um, another one of the really popular house plants these days, something like this probably would cost you $500. Um, they're, they're just, for whatever reason, have become really, really hot these days. Um, we have a, a significant bromeliad collection, um, which a lot of it came as a donation uh, back in the 90s. And moving around the corner, um, lots of these plants are just, you know, they have various rooms that they work well in color-wise. Um, some don't go down until they go into bloom. We have a, a big Hoya collection, um, and I'll show you a flower on one of them, but um, a number of different Hoya species. <clears throat> this is another Anthurium. This is Anthurium. We think it's Bakeri. It came from the San Francisco Conservatory of Flowers. Back in 2004, they gave us a big donation of plants. Um, and this is one of them that has these showy fruits um, that are colored up right now. <clears throat> And then coming back into the main room, more bromeliads, more of the Hoyas. This is a round leaf one that we have. This is blue ginger. Um, it's in the, um, it's not in the ginger family, but it's called blue ginger, um, Dicora sandra. And back here we have um, more of the monsters that we've propagated from, from the collection and um, plan for those is to probably sell those during, during holidays. And then we have here a Hoya that's um, coming into bloom. Here is a, a bud um, that's, the flowers are just expanding. And here's another bud with fewer flowers, but the flowers are just about to, to pop open. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and they're very waxy. Um, this species, they smell like um, kind of artificial chocolate. So um, kind of a, a nice attractive smell to them. And then let's head into the orchid room next door. Not a lot blooming in the orchid department right now. Uh, a lot of the orchids bloom in winter and spring, um, but we have this one really beautiful Cattleya that's in um, full bloom. And I tell people uh, when they come into the main greenhouse that, uh, you know, usually we're open and the house is, has plants in it. So at any one time, the best plants would be down in the house. But right now we have everything up in here because Unfortunately, the house is closed um, due to um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, but more bromeliads, a big collection of chain orchids that um, aren't in bloom um, right now. Well, there's one right in here that has kind of a green flower that's blooming. Um, lots of bromeliads that we have um, either bought in or propagated um, to use for sale in, in, in the garden shop. We also have lots of um, Spanish moss that we use for display in uh, around uh, plants to kind of hide the mechanics when we sink a terracotta pot into a more decorative pot. There's this beautiful, um, really interesting bromelia. This is the octopus palanzia. Um, it's, it's being obscured by this carnivorous plant, which we have growing in the corner here, but um, really a, an unusual plant um, here in the collection. And a few more orchids in bloom, some dendrobiums, here, um, and then some Phalaenopsis, the moth orchid um, that are, have come back into bloom, and then um, some Vanda types that are just wrapping up. And then we'll go back out. <clears throat> and um, here we have a cycad that we added to the collection maybe 15 years ago that um, is one of our bigger plants. It's with the one we use in the garden house. Um, lots of, of house plants that we have uh, in limits of being propagated to sell in the garden shop. Whenever we need to chop up our, our plants in the collection um, to make them smaller um, or to, to restart them, we'll take lots of cuttings and then use those for um, plants to sell in the garden shop.
Okay, going back outside the courtyard. Let's head over to the north greenhouse. Originally, this was our production greenhouse. And um, in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, Filoli and the National Trust did a study of the greenhouses and their uses and, and the needs for the future. And it was decided that this production house was too small. So we converted the south house, which we'll go to in a little bit, into uh, the production house. Um, and this greenhouse was um, converted uh, or repurposed into being a, um, another of our tropical, house, tropical houses. We usually keep this house a little shadier and um, have a lot of ferns, um, a lot of philodendrons. Um, I, I spoke of the collection that we got from the Conservatory of Flowers. This is another one. This is philodendron or grow some. This is um, philodendron aerobescens. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we have over here a really beautiful leaved one, um, philodendron gloriosum, I think. Yeah, philodendron gloriosum, which has a beautiful uh, venation. Uh, and here we grow lots of uh, mosses that are used as kind of foundation or um, lower lower level plants in the vignettes that we'll do in the garden house and the portico. Um, we have some caladiums that are asleep right now. And uh, one of the plants that people really um, are just awestruck by um, when we bring it into the house, um, this isn't the better, this isn't the best of our, our specimens, but this is a uh, lycopodium. Like this is um, a, a primitive plant um, that the, the lycopods are from um, Southeast Asia, Philippines, places like that. Um, and um, what one of the characteristics of a, uh, a, a primitive plant is that it has this bifurcating um, branching habit where it branches and the two branches are the same length. And so you can see in this branch here, it breaks and then another branch breaks again and then it breaks again and they all are um, the same length, um, the two branches. Um, so uh, another primitive plant we have is the silo silotum, um, nudum, whisk fern, um, which will become a big kind of cousin it sort of plant when, it, um, when they fill out. Um, we have some bigger ones back on the other side, but I'm not gonna go over there in the interest of time. Um, but you can see some of the other lycopods, uh, lycopodium. It's actually now Husperia is the genus. Um, Squarosa, um, ferns, and um, other viney plants that we use for display. Um, some bird's nest ferns over here in the corner. Um, and then lots of maiden here ferns, again, are used like the moss as um, backdrop plants for, for plants in the collection. Oh, here we have one of our, uh, another carnivorous plant, this is a butterwort in the genus Pinguicula, and we actually use these in places to catch fungus gnats, which are um, a, a little fly that um, lays its eggs in moist soil, and the, the larva can eat the roots, will eat the roots of um, your house plants and other things, and can, you know, eventually compromise them and kill them. So we use these uh, butterwort plants to catch the fungus gnats, and then um, keep the, the populations down so that other plants aren't damaged. Okay, now let's head, I thought we'd go to the propagation house next. <clears throat> so, Jim, Jim we yeah. have a question about right. the, the lycopodium. Do yeah. you propagate it? Is it for sale? We, um, we struggled for 20 years to figure out how to propagate it and finally, mm -hmm figured out. It's a very slow process though where you break off branches and then soak them in water in a mason jar full of water until little roots form and then it can be stuck into a cutting medium and grown. So we occasionally will have plants and we'll offer them just for sale but it's um, unfortunately you know more rare than, than we'd like because people do do love them and would like them. Um, they, and they're fairly easy. They do prefer a more humid um, environment, but these days people are pretty adept at growing more of the challenging plants. And, um, um, so we, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll do more to advertise the special plants are coming available on the website um, and offer them to members first, uh, because we know that's one that people really um, would like to get their hands on. 
So I'm going over to the side nursery here um, on the way to the propagation house, um, which was built in the early 80s from um, some homeowner type kit greenhouses um, that the uh, facilities department repurposed and turned into this, this bigger um, propagation house. But back here, this is where a lot of the plants that are grown for the cutting garden and the kitchen garden, um, more panel garden oriented plants. And then this is the hoop house where we store, put our citrus in during winter. It's, usually, it's covered with plastic during the winter. Right now it's open. Um, and uh, we still have some citrus up here that um, are hopefully going to get down to the garden soon. But let's go into the prop house. We have the fans going, hopefully it's not too loud. There's the, the north side and then the u bench, and each of those we can set the temperature for the bench and we can set the mist system to go off um, at a, a particular interval um, whether we want it more wet or drier and we actually a couple years ago converted over to this electronic leak system and uh, the way this works is that this this screen uh, mimics a leaf and um, when the mist goes off it hits the screen and weighs it down until it's fully saturated and then the mist system goes off and then as the water evaporates like the water does off of the surface of the leaf you can see there's still some water on these leaves here it will raise up and then it's actually it looks like it's very close to coming to the top and then the mist goes off again wets the screen the system turns off so it's a nice um, way of keeping the cuttings moist and uh, so that they have the ability to um, generate roots and then eventually form plants. Okay. So moving back toward the greenhouse courtyard. This is the passageway. We have a gate here to keep the deer from, this courtyard is not um, gated or fenced. So the deer do wander in here, especially uh, in summer, looking for debris in the back of our truck that goes to the compost. So we need to have that gate there to keep the deer from getting into the garden. <clears throat> um, this black cloth area here is where we store all the daffodil pots that we do in uh, November, December um, for the garden. Uh, daffodils um, aren't eaten by the deer, so we can put daffodil pots out here. And then moving into the south greenhouse. This is our production greenhouse. As I mentioned, this house, um, uh, this and the north greenhouse kind of flip purposes. This was um, originally a lath structure um, that was um, converted into a proper greenhouse in the uh, mid, mid 90s. And it's um, net, it, we required more space for all the production we do for all the bedding plants, um, plants for the garden shop. So that's why we converted to this, uh, this, in, this bigger space into, into production. Um, when that was done, as in the North House, the um, old wooden benches that were in there were converted into a metal bench, and this is actually a rolling bench. So you can see there's a aisle way on the right side, but not on the right left. But this rolls so that you can just have aisle way on one side and that that gives you about a third more um, surface area for for planting having rolling benches and just moving around right now we have lots of succulents we actually have a lot of things that are in production for holidays um, we've actually had visitor services folks have helping us um, interpretation folks helping us um, pot up containers um, that we'll offer on sale during holidays um, Kelly Osborne, who's the lead up in the greenhouse, is working on these um, succulent topiaries that we're going to use for holiday display. Um, but lots of succulents in the background there, um, things that we have propagated ourselves. We buy in from succulents, but we'll also, uh, we also have a collection that we propagate from. You can see this flat of Echeveria elegans. I'm just taking little pieces and um, popping them into the cutting mix to, to root them. And then on this side, um, I'll take a quick spin, more um, succulent and, and similar plants. Also a number of um, tropicals, um, house plants that we're, we're growing on for the shop um, for a little later in the season. Um, the begonias, 
that um, we cut back each year and we'll, we'll take cuttings from them and um, offer those for sale. <clears throat> and then you can see our little succulent mixed container production that's going on here. Um, one of the other, the second of the two born era plants that we have in the collection today is this um, cycad. This is a cycad native to the Northern Australia. Its uh, botanic name is Lepidozamia parovskiana, and <clears throat> it uh, lived for decades and decades in the main greenhouse. Um, and at one point we needed to move it um, into a, a bigger pot. It would no longer fit. We grew it outside for a while. We tried growing it in the woodland for a while. It didn't succeed because the roots were so um, compacted from being in a container that they wouldn't grow out into the native soil. And uh, so we moved it back in the greenhouse. And since it's moved into this greenhouse, it has fruited twice. And cycads are either male or female. Um, this is a female cycad, um, but because we don't have a male, it, um, it doesn't produce fertile seeds, but it's a beautiful um, brown and blue green um, cone up there um, that will come to maturity and then break apart. Um, and it'll produce seeds, but it won't, uh, it'll produce fruit, but there will be no seeds, no viable seeds inside. Okay, now we're gonna head outside to the south of the south greenhouse into the nursery area. So you can see uh, coal frames, original coal frames, they, they were, were all part of the design that Arthur Brown um, designed as part of this whole complex. Our, our newer potting shed, which um, was built over uh, the footprint um, plus of the original potting shed that was there, and then more coal frames here. Right now, um, in the coal frames, <clears throat> we have leftover plants from <clears throat> the, the summer display. These are replacements that we keep on hand. Some of the petunias that are in the Shark Cathedral, um, Angelonia, uh, plants that have been moved up into four inch that are for, sorry for my shadow, for the um, sundial garden. Um, out beyond these frames is a lot of the uh, area that's used to grow plants for the garden shop and some of the more woody plants that are for display and for the, for the collection. Um, we have some head coat lavender that we propagated to use for replacing some of the gaps in the knot garden. Uh, lots of Lewisia. This is a, a succulent that grows well outside. It has its roots in a California native species and then some other Western U.S. natives. Lewisia. <clears throat> lots of boxwood. Um, lavender for, that might be lavender for the, the um, visitor center. Um, so then this is the potting shed. We'll head in there. I can show you what happens in the potting shed. Um, a lot more succulents here. Um, there's a frame here, let me get in the shade, where we um, bring our uh, cymbidium orchids outside during the, the summer and then those go back in the greenhouse for the winter because uh, we're just a little too cold here for them. Some replacement roses. So into the potting shed. <clears throat> potting shed is made up of two bigger rooms. Um, so this is um, for the main entrance. And um, this is kind of the, the project room. We have staff um, who work in here. Um, several, there are four closets, each with different um, storage um, for different things, holidays, tags, um, some fertilizer and some of them. Um, there's usually a, a long, a, a 16 foot work table in here. Right now we just have a, a shorter work table. The, herb, the um, uh, lavender group who does a lot of the products with lavender and herbs works in here. Um, we have two refrigerators in here. Uh, the one on the right is where we store all of the, the seeds that aren't in production. Um, and there are millions and millions of seeds in different tubs and containers in here. And then um, the greenhouse to the left uh, is uh, where we um, store miscellaneous things during the year, but then when we're working on uh, tulip pots, that's where the tulips go. Um, uh, as we're, we're going through the, the different sets. We have bins here for fertilizer um, and we have our, our seedling mix, um, the mix that we buy in. There's a, a comparable bin on the other side of the room that is our cutting mix, which is a, a peat and perlite mix. 
Um, a lot of uh, the equipment that the Bonsai Group uses is stored behind where this greenhouse, this um, computer is. So very much a multi-purpose room. Um, we have a small office in the um, kind of in the middle of the building um, where the senior staff from the greenhouse and, and horticulture work. And then we have our soil room. And um, we have these long benches that we can fill with soil. I'll take you out to the soil mixer in a bit. And um, this is where um, <clears throat> plants are transplanted from, from uh, seed flats or cuttings. Um, here's a, an empty flat that's um, gonna be used for cuttings, um, I suppose. And then we have uh, these boxes that you can put up on the bench when you're doing work that's small, that's um, kind of tighter, um, and you need to, to bring it up closer to um, your, your, your face and your arms. And, um, and then when you're doing big pots, you can just set the big pots right on the bench and um, have them at, at a good height as well. These mocked the benches that were in the old headhouse building. This building was built as part of a donation to Filoli from, the, from Gordon and Betty Moore, who lived next door to Filoli, um, which included um, the potting shed, the head house um, remodel, um, the shop that's across from the cottage where the folks who uh, maintain the area around the, the house um, have their um, tools and equipment. Um, and then uh, the area behind the garden shop is also part of that, that project. But this was kind of the major building building this new potting shed, really a, a spectacular building for the operations that go on in the greenhouse. Okay. Jim, we have a question about soil. Do you Good. generalize the soil that you use in the greenhouses and just in general? We presently don't. It's something that we're talking about. It's becoming a, a more and more of a hot topic, whether um, you sterilize your soil. Um, most of the components are, are sterile. Um, in, in our mix, <clears throat> there are uh, rice hulls, which are the, the kind of the long brown um, beige um, things that are in here, which replaced perlite. There's a little bit of perlite here. Was, um, it's a more sustainable um, product, the, the rice hulls are than, than the perlite. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, uh, there is uh, coconut fiber coir, um, which we uh, replay, we substituted for uh, peat moss, which we used for years and years, an another more sustainable product. And then red redwood sawdust, um, which is just the sawdust that's produced from the lumber industry and sand are all sterile, but we also have our compost in here. And that is the one thing that is not, um, it's, it's very rich in good microorganisms, but it, it potentially has some bad microorganisms. So we don't sterilize it. Um, because everything else is sterile and the compost presumably is, is bringing good microbes into the mix. Um, it's, it's a good thing, but um, there's a lot of concerns with um, fungal diseases, Phytophthora, sudden oak, things like that, um, which are <clears throat> causing us to reevaluate our, our soil making and potentially um, move towards sterilizing it ultimately. Okay. <clears throat> So back out into the nursery and um, back here is the shade. Um, so this is a big storage area, uh, lots and lots of pots that um, have been re, uh, that we use over and over again. Um, our, our technique for, for cleaning those is that we soak them in this big horse trough just to remove the dirt and the, the salts that build up. You can see here the, the, the salt that builds up on terracotta as it's, um, when it has soil and it, it's being watered again and again. The salts um, uh, go into the terracotta and then move their way out during the evaporation of the water um, through the terracotta. <clears throat> um, but just soaking the pots in water will, uh, and scrubbing it, quickly with a brush, we'll remove the salt and any algae that's on there and clean that up pretty well. We don't sterilize these pots. We could very easily just throw a little bleach into the water. Um, but um, again, because our, our soil isn't sterile, um, it, it doesn't seem to make, make too much sense to go through that extra step. Um, so back here, um, this is part of our, our more shady part of the nursery. There's some larger display plants. Um, back in here, some hydrangeas, 
and uh, begonias that would be in the in the portico now if um, uh, or we'll eventually we'll make their way into the portico. Um, some of our bonsai collection that has moved up from the garden. Uh, there's wisteria and Japanese maples, some of the, the more shade loving things uh, or do the ones that do better in more shade. Um, camellias that didn't sell from last spring uh, in the shop that will we'll move down um, this, this fall probably or, or during holidays. Let me just see if I can get a little closer to, um, this was an area that we didn't have good coverage, but there's a whole other section of nursery back here and you can see a structure back there hopefully um, that's the building we call the fuchsia house that's where mrs roth overwintered her fuchsias um, we now use it when we uh, move through harvesting the bulbs the, the daffodils out of the pots um, from the previous spring they get um, put up into crates and then stored in that building until we um, naturalize them in the daffodil meadow or somewhere else on the, on the property um, we have some storage sheds back here. And we have, um, you know, we have a, a wonderful collection of staghorn ferns here at Farloli that mostly have been donations. And this was, these were a couple more that came in a few years ago um, that we haven't been able to um, get hung up. So for now, we're chipping off pieces and, and planting them onto boards. And, and those are the ones that we sell in the, in the shop when they're. Um, looking nice. Uh, more storage back here, these different stalls. The one on the left is where we store um, extra soil when we do big batches of soil. And then we have um, stalls with pots and um, flats and cell packs here. You can see just the, the hundreds of flats and, and cell packs that we have for um, all of the, the, the production that we do for, for the garden. And then larger containers um, here, and then some of the medium containers that we'll move plants into um, when they, uh, when we're moving things up from cell packs to four inch to, to have for replacement. Um, let me just pop back here. And I'll show you um, over in the distance there, that is our soil mixer. It's um, a WW Gleason two yard uh, soil mixer. Um, it's got, it has a cover over it, um, but it has, uh, it's, it's, um, has the capacity <clears throat> to, it's, it's wide enough that we can dump tractor loads of the different components into the, the mixer. And then at the end closest to us is where there's a hatch that you can um, pull a wheel, wheelbar under and unload the soil and then take it to wherever you want to do, go fill up the soil benches, put it in the stall. But you can see um, to the right is a pile of sand. Um, so that's the sand component. And then here are um, bags of rice hulls and the um, uh, coconut fiber that we use in the mix. And um, we have a, a pile of compost off um, in the distance toward the corporation yard. And then um, I don't know if you can see the, the the stone wall through this corporation yard to the other side is where we have the redwood sawdust that is the fifth component. And then we add a, a number of fertilizers to the mix um, that are quick and, and slow release and offer a, a nice balanced mix of um, all the essential nutrients that seedlings or larger plants need um, to, to get to get growing and then we'll later fertilize them with liquid feeds and um, other slow release to uh, to sustain them. <clears throat> so um, back when Sunset Magazine um, closed their offices in Menlo Park four or five years ago, um, they offered us some of the, the plants in their collection. The big Japanese maple that lives in the garden shop for much of the year it was um, one of their plants. This, um, this palm was another one that they donated to us. And then we have, uh, we have variegated with um, holly, and then um, this pomegranate. Let's see if I can get it. Was another one. Um, so very generous of them to um, to offer us these plants. So let's um, let me show you some of the things that we have going on out here in uh, slated for the the shop. I'll also show you this um, beautiful collection of 
containers that have been donated to Filoli over the years. Um, and these were, were made by the Ronier factory that did um, the faces on the garden house and the Filoli um, gate, the, the cartouche that has Filoli going from the um, sunken garden to the, uh, into the wall garden. Um, and so these are plant, these are beautiful containers. Um, we're hoping to, to we've been um, naked in the past, but unfortunately the roots will get into the, the concrete, which they're made from and um, cause them to crack. So um, you can see some of the ones that have, have cracked. So we're looking at, um, um, repairing some of the broken ones and then also looking for liners that we can put in them so we can put a, put a plant in some kind of a plastic liner or something like that and then use them out in the garden because they're they're just beautiful but we we had a plan to move some more of these into the garden um but then coronavirus hit and this is something that a two or three person operation and uh, just not able to social distance and, and move them so um, <clears throat> eventually we'll we'll get these out um, and, and more on view but we have um, some larger boxwood um, that we're growing on. Um, these are actually slated to ultimately replace the, the round balls that are in the shark garden, which have um, just gotten to be too big. Um, so that's the, the plan for these. These are um, shark, we call those meatballs in training. Um, we got in a citrus order recently. So this is some of the back stock citrus. These are some magnolias that we will use in the, use in the garden house. Each spring when they come into bloom, this is Magnolia cylindrica, one of the, the shorter magnolias that grows along the magnolia border in front of the house. And these were propagated from seed from uh, those trees out there. Um, and this is, these, these plants are probably 15 to 18 years old um, that have been in the containers. Um, so they're, they're a, a good workhorse and, and work really well um, as part of the spring display. But out here we have some olives, um, lots of ewes that we're actually propagating. This is something that's not for the shop. These are um, ewes that we're growing um, to have for replacement. Um, to the left of the ewes, you can see um, some wisteria vines. And um, the ewes, the wisteria, the boxwood, um, we'll do lilacs, camellias, are all things that we will uh, propagate from time to time so that we have um, replacements, we have this, the same genetic material as some of the important plants in the collection to use um, when we lose a yew or lose a wisteria or um, one of our boxwood hedges has just um, has failed for some reason or has become too big and we need to start over like we've done in many places in the garden including along the, the lower um, balustrade and um, around the garden house bed. So um, this is an important part of the work that we do here, um, replacing the propagating these plants and having them available for replacing um, should we lose one of the one of the historic plants. Any questions for me? There are a bunch of questions and also um, one request. You've done such yep. a great job selling the soil and your mix that the question yep. is would you ever sell the soil mix? So consider that for the shop. Yeah, we've been we've been asked about both the soil and our compost, um, and um, uh, <clears throat> someday that would be, that would be really nice if we could could offer it. It is it is a great mix. Um, you know, if, if when people ask about that or just ask, you know, what what to, what we recommend, I always tell them, Lingso has really great products down in San Carlos, um, really um, well. Um, balanced, tested soils that are, are good for, um, and you can get good things at Wegmans and some of the other local nurseries or, you know, your, your, your better nurseries. <clears throat> so the, the, the more you pay, typically, the better the, the soil product. Um, the cheap stuff is usually very heavy, doesn't have good drainage, and uh, you, you'll run into challenges for using those cheaper, um, bulkier mixes. Another question, Jim, why have we never seen a fuchsia display at Filoli? Yeah, good question. We, we kept a collection uh, in the, um, you know, 2000, 2010. Uh, fuchsias um, at some point, um, probably in the 80s, um, there was a fuchsia mite that, that came in from South America where a lot of the fuchsias 
are native and um, the fuchsia mite ca causes this horrible contorting of the leaves and the stems and makes the plant unattractive. And there are breeders out there who are working on coming up with um, mite resistant fuchsias that, that um, can resist the, uh, the mite. Um, and so we, we have a few plants in our collection, but, um, and we'll put those in the garden house or the uh, portico when they're, when they're looking nice. Um, but we, we, today we don't have a very big collection to do anything grander than that. Okay, next question, Jim. Um, this says, we love to buy from the shop your pesto dry herb mix in the shaker pile. Where do you grow these herbs? Um, when I was at the propagation house, uh, a little to the north of there, we have a bed of herbs that we <clears throat> um, grow for the, for the urban vinegar group. Uh, so that is the, the primary place um, they harvest from for um, some of the herbs in the, in the, uh, the, the uh, herb mixes that we grow, uh, that we produce for the garden shop. And don't forget, you can use your member discount when you're in the garden shop. <clears throat> Uh, another question, I was wondering if we can tell the garden shop or tell when they're in the garden shop which plants are propagated from the Born and Roth eras or even plants that came from the Born and Roth families. Are we propagating and selling those? We are and um, that's, that's, um, that's something that we're hoping to do more of is to really um, highlight the important plants. Plant any plant that comes from the garden. Um, for a while, we, uh, we used a um, tag that said phyllally propagated, uh, meaning that it came from some aspect of the collection. Um, but to, to highlight beyond that, um, it's, it's, it's more of a time constraint thing, but something that we definitely aspire to do is to call out um, the historic significance of the plants that we sell in the shop. Um, when, whenever we have some of the historic things down there. So that's, that's definitely something that we hope to do eventually. Can you um, tell us, give us some tips for citrus and containers, particularly how long before they can uh, get really root bound? Yeah, good question. Uh, so um, number one, the thing that people always come to me with about their citrus is that they ha are having yellowing leaves. And uh, citrus uh, in containers definitely uh, are prone to being overwatered, and that's what causes the yellow of the leaves. So we typically water our citrus once to twice a week in the summer. So use that as your guide for how much you water. They like to be kept more on the droughty side. And then uh, we will typically try to repot them every uh, two to four years. And we will often repot them into the same container, um, kind of like what you would do with a bonsai. So we'll pull it out of the container, remove the outer inch or two of soil, and then uh, repot it with fresh soil. And they're usually good to go for another um, two to four years. Um, they tend to be heavy feeders, so it's good to um, give them you know, fish emulsion or some other liquid feed like miracle Grow, And then also a slow release like Osmocote or something like that um, to keep them fed throughout the growing season. And um, with Jim, that, you should have. With my yeah. own citrus, I have a problem where I don't know when to repot it because it always has fruit on it and at some stage. In it, yeah. Is there a, a good time or a bad time? Uh, early spring is usually a good time. Um, bad time is there's usually not a bad time. I mean, it may have some dieback, but usually it'll, um, you may have to cut back the dieback, but it'll, it'll overcome, they'll overcome that. But usually the best time is in um, February, March time frame. Around here is a good time to repot citrus. You ready for more questions? I am. Uh, how many pots do you fill with daffodils and tulips? in the spring? In spring, we usually do about 3,000 containers. Wow. Um, yeah, and then probably another two to 300 um, pansies and fox gloves. So, um, and then usually probably another 500 to 1,000 pots in summer with the platoon. 
And you have quite a team there, a really great team of horticulturalists you work with. How many staff do you work with? Total on the team is 14, including myself. And um, each of the garden sections, the five garden sections has a lead. Um, and then we have um, one to two and a half assistants. Um, the area around the house, the sunken garden, the wall garden have one assistant. The panel garden has one that works one and a half. We have one and a half assistants, and the other half of that assistance time is in the greenhouse, and then two more assistants in the uh, greenhouse area. Um, and then we have the awesome Kate Knoll, who's the uh, horticulture manager here, who is, works under me and is responsible for the day to day operations of the horticulturist and um, keeping this huge machine running smoothly. Yeah, and you have a great internship program as well. <clears throat> We do, um, yeah. Unfortunately, that's something that we had to uh, put on hold this year. Um, but uh, we will have anywhere from um, four to eight interns each year. Um, and the intern program um, is great because we're training um, horticulturists to do work like what we do at Fiole. They rotate through all the garden areas and learn the work in all those areas and work with, with different staff, which gives them a really good um, immersive work experience. Um, but also um, it's a great feeder program for staffing. Uh, right now, I think we have five on the staff who are um, past horticulturists. Um, we've had as many as nine of the 14 who, or sorry, interns. We have had as many as nine of the 14 who have been um, former interns. So it's really an important feeder program um, for the horticulture department. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that we're talking a lot about and, and, and figuring out for the future um, what we want the intern program to be. We, want, we definitely want it to be more um, inclusive and to be able to track um, new students and different students and students who are just um, thinking they may have an interest in horticulture. So it's, it's, it hopefully will become a much more um, exciting program in the future. Thanks, Jim. Um, can we talk about camellias? There's some questions about caring for camellias and, and repotting them. Yeah. Um, so camellias, the best time to repot camellias, um, and it's the same same thing, pull them out of the pot. You can either, you know, if you're starting with something small, you know, you, you bought a one gallon, you put it into an eight inch or a 10 inch pot. Um, when it starts to get root bound, you can um, work the roots and then move it up into a bigger pot. But once you reach that ultimate size that you um, want to keep it in um, for, you know, your use, your space, your ability to, um, to handle it, um, then um, same program, you pull it out of the pot every two to four years, remove the outer couple inches of soil, repot it with fresh soil. Um, the best time to re repot camellias is uh, when they're in bloom. So um, if it's a Sasanqua, you want to do it in um, fall. If it's a, if it's a um, Japonica, you want to do it in um, you know, uh, February, March, April, um, that time period. Um, usually reticulatas aren't grown in, in containers. We don't, we've never done them. I, I don't know how, how successful they are, but um, that's kind of the time period you want to do it. Uh, and then after they bloom is when they send out their flush of new growth. And uh, summer is the best time to prune them. Um, so to cut them back and, and shape them um, how you want. Um, usually um, just back to around where the new shoots have elongated. Um, maybe a little bit above where they elongated uh, or you know where that, that elongation started or a little bit below um, just to try to keep it in balance and, and uh, a good size. Jim Foley has a beautiful collection of bonsai as well, especially on the dining room terrace. How do you care for that collection? We are very fortunate to have a group from a local bonsai society. Um, and I always want to say it's Kusamara, the Kusamara Bonsai Society, which is in Palo Alto. And they, uh, there are, I think now currently four to six members who are also garden volunteers and they, they take care of our, our bonsai for us. Um, and we definitely miss them right now when we're not able to have volunteers at Filoli. Um, but they do all, they're just, they're, you know, they're, they have a passion for bonsai. They have 
um, learn from each other, learn from classes, learn from um, seminars. And um, they do all of the training, all of the pruning, all of the repotting. Um, we, we supply them what they need, but they do all the work. Um, so it's a really, really uh, wonderful program and um, they really benefited. Um, Philole in the collection um, uh, over the years. Um, this has been going on for 25 years. Um, there were a few bonsai that were left when the Ross left here, but the majority of the collection came from two Hillsborough states, um, from families who knew the Roths, and uh, and then also from the Demoto nursery. There were plants that were left as the Demoto nursery was um, being turned over to new owners, um, people who owned the, bought the land from the Demoto family, and uh, so the collection is mostly made up of, of those three um, donations that we received. We have a question about our honey. Where the hives are? Yeah, um, we have. Um, well, I know we keep hives down in the orchard um, on the far east side. Uh, and this October, um, because we're not able to do our autumn, what were they called? Harvest festival and orchard days um, because of the pandemic, um, our orchards will be open uh, every weekend in October. Um, and it'll just be an added value. You can walk down there and um, go um, walk amongst the trees. There'll be some activities, some interpretation. Uh, there'll be food and a bar and maybe some artists and things down there. But the um, the, the hives are, um, will be tucked back there. Um, we'll probably have to cordon it off because um, we probably won't have anyone with them for most of the event. And um, you can see the hives there. Um, there was a time when we kept hives also um, beyond the corporation yard. I don't know if we currently have any there uh, today, but um, that was another place where we, we kept hives. But there, the, the, the nice, beautiful collection of them um, laid out its own portrait. Jim, do you have a favorite plant in the greenhouse? I think one of my favorites is the, the lycopodium that I showed you. Uh, I, it's, it's so unusual. It, you know, I think it, it, because it is a weird plant, um, you know, I'm, I'm around thousands of different plants every day, um, and, and it's the ones that are a little bit more unusual that call out to me. Some of there's uh, some of the orchids, the chain orchids that I talked about, uh, when they come into bloom, are also a favorite. Um, I, I, probably... I, also, I also love the chain orchids. The smell that some of them have a beautiful fragrance. And some of them have a really pungent smell that will yeah. the visitor center or <laughs> the foyer in the house. Yeah, there uh, and it that that trait carries over to a lot of plants that have a kind of an acid yellow chartreuse color. Um, it's all of the dendrochylums, the chain orchids that are have that that color, have that smell. Um, but I've also witnessed it in other plants, and of course I'm blanking on what those are, but <clears throat> there are some other plants uh, that also have that color that, that have that same smell. And it's, I actually don't hate it. Um, it. To me, it smells kind of lemony and fresh. It's almost like cilantro, how some people have a palate for cilantro and other people have the gene that makes it taste soapy. To me, um, it, it doesn't offend me, but I know there are a lot of people who just run from the room if they smell it. So uh, yeah, um, you're not alone. Um, so I think we're on our last question here. It's actually a couple questions. Um, really interested in the vanilla beans that you were showing us earlier. Uh, so the two questions are, how do you keep those for years? And then what was the alcohol or, a li or the liquid that you merged the vanilla beans in? Yeah. Um, if you keep them in a Ziploc bag, uh, you know, they probably are, I've had these, a good eight years um, and they're they're pretty stiff um, but you probably could I could probably soak them in a little bit of alcohol or even water to rehydrate them if I was going to um, slice them and scrape the seeds up for a dessert or something um, but just keeping them in a, a tightly sealed ziploc bag um, will keep them moist for a number of years um, and, and turning them into vanilla bean, oh, sorry, into vanilla extract, um, the more beans, the better, actually. So if you could put 
30 in there, you'd get a really intense vanilla extract. Um, and I just use cheap vodka. Um, you don't have to use anything fancy. It's, it's the same alcohol content as what they use for um, vanilla extract, extract that you buy. So um, just something, um, when, I, when I got that bag of, I, I actually got several bags of vanilla beans and um, did up a bunch of bottles that I bought at a health food store and did fill them with alcohol and then gave them away as Christmas presents. So it's a, a um, if you can get the beans pretty cheaply, you know, a, a Costco or a vodka or something like that works perfect. And then, you know, it's good to let them set for a good month before you give them away as gifts and, you know, they can be used as gifts any time of the year. But, um, and then, like I said, I have two bottles and, um, I'll use this one down, but when I finish the last one, I filled it with vodka and then it'll sit, you know, sometimes two years before I empty that bottle and, uh, and then, um, then refill the, the one I empty and go again. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed their vanilla Palomas. Mine was very refreshing, perfect for a summer night here at Filoli. Uh, I just, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Jim, for the great tour. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you everybody. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, and, and just to remind you, um, this is an exclusive members event. We're gonna do this again every month this year. And if you have friends that you think would enjoy it, would enjoy Filoli and membership, ask them to support us through purchasing a membership. Memberships are also a great gift. Uh, I also wanna remind you, if you don't feel comfortable coming to Filoli, it's not uh, there's other ways to participate, like our um, virtual offerings. We have um, beautiful photos and videos on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. So please join us in whatever way you feel comfortable. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, members. I hope to see you again next month. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.